coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Parish, welcome back. CBS Sports Ion College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky black. The Ion College Basketball Podcast is presented by Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's sub above. Kyle Boone's here. Strong jaw. If you watch it on YouTube, smash the like button like your brain and Davies. You have consent. And please, while you're here, if you haven't done it already, also subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. Let's get into it. One half of the Sweet 16 is done. One half of the Elite Eight is set. Let's start in the West region where we got a couple of upsets on Thursday night. Were you looking forward to North Carolina, Arizona? Were you looking forward to Caleb Love against his former team? Because if so, I got terrible news. Also terrible news if you're a Carolina fan or an Arizona fan. They ain't going to play. There's are over and that's because we had two upsets in los angeles on thursday night final score clemson 77 arizona 72 that was game one final score alabama 89 north carolina 87 that was game two it sounds like a college football playoff game clemson (laughs) alabama in los angeles on a saturday but it's not it's an elite eight game in the 2024 ncaa tournament and the winning school and the winning coach will be in the final four for the first time the following weekend. Strong job. Before we discuss each game individually, just your thoughts on Alabama Clemson meeting in the Elite Eight as a four seed and a six seed. Yeah, wild. Um, an exciting night of, of Sweet 16 action. Alabama put on a show, put on a clinic on offense. Uh, Grant Nelson was awesome. Clemson, they did the dang thing. And this did not feel at all like uh, a fluky outcome. You know, I, I think Arizona I would still pick to beat Clemson. And I, and I think probably eight out of 10 times that would happen. But, you know, on this night, Clemson just kind of kicked them up and down the floor. And um, Clemson, just the way they played on defense, Arizona, unfortunately, the way they shot on offense. Uh, now we have Clemson, Alabama in the elite, out, elite eight. So I'm pretty excited about that. Let's just focus on on the games in the order that we were they were played. So let's start with the Clemson Arizona game. Were you surprised that Clemson, for lack of a better phrase, punched first? They kind of came out, took control, and then pretty much controlled the game from start to finish. I don't want to say it was never in doubt because it obviously was, but this wasn't a situation where the lower seeded team, uh, you know, hung around and then made some shots and then got lucky. They, they won the game for 40 minutes, basically. I was surprised. Yeah, I mean, this Arizona team has has some volatility to it. Um, you know, the way they play offense, they, they play high, an up-tempo style. Um, they sh- Tonight, in particular, they shot a ton of uh, three-point shots, ended up finishing 5 of 28 from three, and that was, to me, the story. Clemson kind of ran out a zone defense, and Arizona just – chucking shots, settling, settling, settling. They just had no answers uh, for that. Uh, Brad Brunell, after the game, said he felt incredibly fortunate, which uh, was about right. Uh, He more or less was uh, alluding to the fact that Arizona had a really, really tough night shooting the basketball. Again, finished 5 of 28 from three-point range. They play this game again. Arizona probably... I don't know if they win this game, but they certainly make more than five three-point shots just because this offense is so, so potent. But uh, on this given night, Clemson played better. They punched first. They held them off late. Arizona just did not have the offense to kind of keep up in this game. Um, So I was in studio, obviously, tonight. That's why I'm in a tie. It's also why we're starting late. I apologize. And at one point, Brent Stover, who was hosting tonight, asked me, you know what? So if you're an Arizona fan, like how do you make sense of of this, and how do you view the season? And it, that's always a difficult thing to try to do, particularly after it it, it ends um, so abruptly. But it's difficult to do because this is a sport where we play basically for five months, and unless the end is good, the first four months don't matter. Mm-hmm. And if the end is good, it's almost like the first four months don't matter. Like it's, it's, it's um, North Carolina played in a national championship game a few years ago. You might remember Um, North Carolina did not have a good season 
but they had a great tournament. Right. And then uh, every year there's teams that have great seasons but don't have great tournaments. Purdue last season is a great example of that. Yeah. And I think Arizona right now is is that as well. Um, some of it was when your best player is Caleb Love. You know, you leave yourself a little susceptible to this. He five of 18 from the field, O of nine from three. Don't put this all on him because it's not all on him. Yeah. But when Caleb Love is your best player, he's going to have some great nights and he's going to have some rough nights. That's the story of Caleb Love. And when he has the rough nights, he ain't going to stop. You know, he it, there's never a moment where he's going to go, I missed the first eight. Might not take this one. You know, he's going to keep doing what he does. And if it's not going well and you're playing against a competent opponent and there's other things also not going well, then this is the type of thing that happened. I don't want to pretend that I predicted this because I didn't. But earlier today, when Norlander and I did the Island College Basketball Podcast on CBS Sports Network, I did say, if you look at Arizona, they, before this game, had lost eight times all season. Mm-hmm. Now it's nine, obviously, and that'll be the final number forever. But heading into this game, they'd lost eight times. And seven of the eight losses were to sub-30 Ken Palm teams. Right. And Clemson was, I think, before tip-off, top 25 at Ken Palm, certainly top 30. So my point was, Arizona should win this game. Arizona is the better team. But, but they've lost a lot of games to a lot of teams, just like Clemson, or even worse. So, like, you know, be careful. And then, and then what happened, happened. And so now the question becomes, like, how do you view Arizona's season? It was a great season with a bad ending. It's the same thing I said about Virginia a few years ago, about Purdue last season. It was a great season with a bad ending. And I now know that that's three years for Tommy Lloyd at Arizona, two conference championships, two conference tournament championships, incredible seeds in every tournament, and he loses to a lower-seeded team every time. Hasn't made it to the Elite Eight yet. I got it. But I don't know if you saw his post-game interview with Allie LaForce. I loved it. I hope they pull it and use it going forward the same way we constantly pull that Dan Hurley press conference moment Mm -hmm. where he says, you better get us now because it's coming. Allie asked Tommy, I don't remember the question exactly, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but at the end of it, Tommy said, listen, you know, we didn't shoot the ball well, and, and, you know, when you do that, sometimes this is the type of stuff that can happen, but this is the part that I zeroed in on. He said, we will be – back in this position many, many times. Mm -hmm. And I believe that firmly. And what he seemed to be suggesting in a humble but confident way is, I'm not rattled by this. I know other people are. I've even seen it in the chat tonight since we started talking. Tommy Lloyd, built for the regular season, not built for the incident. I don't buy any of that. I think it's all nonsense. I think the nature of this event is going to, always lend itself to, you know, Oakland over Kentucky, right? That kind of stuff has forever happened and it will forever happen. And sometimes those kind of things happen to the same programs over and over again in a way where it starts to feel like, well, maybe this guy really can't do these things. I will never forget, and I've told this story 45,000 times, but I will never forget talking to Billy Donovan after he won his first national championship. And one of the things he said, and I guess I could have just looked this up. I didn't remember it. He clearly remembered it. He said, do you realize before I won this national title, I was eliminated from the first or second round of the NCAA tournament five straight years. <laughs> Not get out of the NCAA tournament. First or second round. I couldn't make the second weekend five straight years. He said, Google my name. I'm paraphrasing here, but he was like, Google me. It, like it was out there. Can Billy Donovan win the big one? Mm-hmm. Oh, Billy, Billy Donovan can't get out of the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. That's all they said. And... Then they did, and then they won the whole thing, and then they won the whole thing again, and now he's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer someday, right? Um, The point Billy made to me was if you keep building teams that are theoretically good enough to advance, to go deep, to go to a Final Four, to win a national team, if you keep building enough of those, eventually it'll happen for you. You're going to need some luck along the way. You're going to need something to bounce your way. And sometimes it's not going to bounce your way, and that'll be the years where you lose in the round of 32. But if you keep building top-shelf teams, eventually it will happen. And it did for Billy. I believe it will for Tommy. 
And there's a long list of guys who couldn't do it until they did. Right. I can remember going on radio in Kansas City over and over again. And they would ask me, pre-2008, do you think Bill Self can really win the big game? I swear <laughs> to God. Like, you know, when's this guy going to break through? Can he do it? Scott it Drew. Was, yeah. Uh, it, every, uh, I don't want to say every guy because that's not true. But there is a long list of guys. Bill Self, Jay Wright, John Calipari. Hey, are we sure this guy can do it? Right. He ain't done it yet. Well, let me tell you what they are doing. And this is what they were all doing. Billy before his title, John before his title, Bill Self before his title, Tommy Lloyd right now. You know what they were all doing? Building teams annually, rather consistently, that are theoretically good enough to go to Final Fours and win national championships. And eventually, because those men kept doing it over and over again, it broke through and happened for every one of them. And I, I just keep this. It'll happen for Tommy Lloyd someday. If Tommy Lloyd coaches at Arizona for 15 years, I do believe that he will win a national championship. He's built three teams already. He's been a head coach three years. He's built three teams already that are good enough to do it. Yeah, yeah it's just hadn't happened. It will. So if you want to get your little jokes in now about Tommy Lloyd can't do this, can't get him in now, because eventually he's going to bust right through that thing. I promise you. I don't know. Dan Hurley's still coaching at UConn, so <laughs> this dynasty is never going to end for the UConn Husky. Well, that, that could be the other problem is that just UConn never loses again. And then nobody ever gets to win anything ever again other than Dan Hurley at UConn. But, you know, on the flip side of this um, result is, you know, a, a Brad Brunel who's lived on the hot she- uh, seat for it feels like forever. Yeah. And so there's a guy who people have been wondering, like, should he even keep his job? Like every year I do a hot seat list and every year I'm like, hey, Brad Brunel, it's good to see you again. Can't believe you're back here, but here you – and um, this will cool it, at least temporarily, and just take that, set it aside. It just couldn't be happier for the guy. Like, mm-hmm. I can't imagine – it's not easy living with job speculation all the time. Have you ever – I don't want to get too personal, so I won't even ask that. But, like, if you're ever in the last year of a contract, you know, and you're like, hey, you know, where is this – you know, have you ever had – people – where this guy has been – like more or less in that place for year after year after year. Like I, I'm here right now and I really like it. I don't know if they'll want me back next year. Yeah. Let me go coach for my job. Like that's a hard way to coach. It's a hard way to, to, to live. And he has found a way to be comfortable in that space. And now it's just, it's just happening for him. You know, is, is it, was there any point in this season where Clemson looked like one of the last eight teams that'd be playing? No, of course not. Of course not. But but that's where they're at. And what I love most about this Final Four in Los Angeles, you know, you just sort of find, I mean, this Elite Eight matchup in Los Angeles, you you, you know, you 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 look for something, and if it ain't there, then you 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 try to find something else. What did I want to watch? I wanted to watch Caleb Love against North Carolina. I thought that would be awesome. Yeah. But but what will I now watch? I'll watch Clemson, Alabama, and that'll be equally awesome because either a Clemson program that most people have never really taken seriously. Or an Alabama program that has been really good. Keep in mind, they were the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament, like, you know, recently. And this team, though, looked nothing like ever being capable of that. Because their own coach a month ago said, we don't guard anybody, if you guys didn't know. And now here they are. One of those programs is going to the Final Four. And that's awesome. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's a great story for Clemson, obviously, Brad Brunel. Uh, Clemson's second Elite Eight appearance in program history. It's their first since 1980. GP, were you alive in 1980? Just barely, but yes. Okay, just checking. Yeah, three. I was. Th- I was three. I was. I was going to be three years old in 1980. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. So we've got it. We've got a few of those now. Yeah. Um, like Purdue hadn't been in the Final Four since 1980. 1980 is a big year in this uh, Sweet 16 Elite Eight. So just a fab. It's not what we expected to 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 see. Uh, you know, happen in that Arizona Clemson game, but um, you know, for Clemson, you you couldn't be happy for them. Then on the other side, Alabama. Let's spend a few minutes on this one. They beat North Carolina, 89-87. The Tar Heels were actually up double digits in this point in this game at one point, and then Alabama just you know stayed true to what they do. And we had talked about this pregame on uh, March Madness 360, CBS Sports Network earlier tonight, and one of the points I'd made was that. If I'm a one seed, Alabama isn't like the best 
you know, four or five seed that we could have theoretically played in the Sweet 16? I mean, maybe they are, but you'll get the point I'm making. But I did think they were the most dangerous mm -hmm. in the sense that you know exactly what they're going to do. And if they do it well, there's not much you can do about it. Yes. Like they're going to – like the actual thing that I said – on television was they're going to try to take 33s. And if they make 11, 12, 13, 14 of them, you're going to have problems. And it really doesn't matter how well you're playing. And then the game started. And what did they do? They didn't quite get to 30, but they got close to it. And they shot above 42% from three. Yep. So when they're doing that, it almost, I don't want to say it doesn't matter how well you're playing, but sometimes you get a matchup like this a sweet 16 matchup, including a one seed. And the one seed can say, I think, honestly, if we play well, we'll be fine. If we play well, we'll be fine. But when you're playing Alabama, there's always a qualifier. We'll be, if we play well, we'll be fine. As long as they don't get wild from three, because right. then we might not be the problem for Carolina. in this one, of course, was that uh, even when Alabama got wild from three um, Carolina, you know, they, they weren't playing well. And a lot of that was RJ Davis. And did you see this? R.J. Davis and Caleb Love tonight in the same building combined to go 0 of 18 from three. Caleb Love 0 of 9 from three. R.J. Davis 0 of 9 from three. These former teammates, backcourt mates on a big stage in advance of, of a matchup that was supposed to involve them. They both throw up stinkers at Crypto.com Arena and become, I saw this from Jared Burson, he invented ESPN stats and info. He did. He said that R.J. Davis and Caleb Love are the first two players in NCAA tournament history to ever both go at least 0 of 9 from three-point range on the same day in the NCAA tournament. Wow. So it's not it's not just in the same building or on uh, or or former teammates that did this. Like no two players in the history of the NCAA tournament have ever played on the same day and both went at least 0 of 9 from three. So R.J. Davis, Caleb, Caleb Love, they've had some incredible moments together, apart this season, but they'll want to forget this night for as long as they live. Yeah, R.J. Davis, 16 points. Uh, seemed good, but 4 of 20 shooting. Uh, that's not great. Omano Baker was pretty good in this game, had 19 points. Missed a dunk uh, in the second half that felt like it was pretty crucial. Uh, per Brian Ives, um, stat here on R.J. Davis, this was the first game all season R.J. Davis did not make a single three-pointer. Um, Carolina ends up losing this game by two points. Just a brutal beat. Uh, Alabama played out of their mind. Grant Nelson was fantastic, 24 points. He had a huge second half, 19 points in the second half, finished with five blocks, including the clincher, kind of swatting Harrison Ingram's prayer at the end there. So it's a great win for Alabama. Uh, we always thought that this was possible for Alabama just because their offense is so lethal. Um, and they get hot tonight, and they're advancing. It's a really impressive win by Nate Oates in this Crimson Tide program. So if you're looking for tip times on a Saturday, the Clemson-Alabama game is actually going to be the late game. It is scheduled to tip at 8.49 p.m. Eastern on TBS. Your six-seed Clemson against your four-seed Alabama. And, you, and, and, buddy, if you live in Southern California and you want to go, I bet you can get in pretty good. Because it looked on TV like the fans in the building were mostly Carolina fans, which would make sense. They were the one seed. So that's going to be a lot of folks, I would assume, traveling back home, um, trying to move tickets. Like, I bet you could go on the secondary market right now and find you a pretty good Clemson, Alabama ticket for an affordable price. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well strong job. If you can get a, I'll get you a flight if you want to go. You just let me know, all right? I'll holler at you. I'm here in Dallas. I'm, I'm going to watch these games first. Let's, let's, move, let's, let's move over to the East region where uh, the reigning national champs are running thing at TD Garden in Boston. We'll do that next. But first, uh, a word from our partners. The blackout mystery. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Oh, all right, on to the East region, and let's start with the reigning national champs. They had the early game, much to the demise of uh, of Dan Hurley, and uh, they made it a blowout, no problem. Final score, UConn 82, San Diego State 52. 
UConn has now won nine straight games in the NCAA tournament by at least 13 points. Um, I'll ask you the same question I was asked tonight on TV because it's starting to get a thing that I think I think most people are are saying yes, but it always felt like such an absurd question to ask, and yet it's just not an absurd question anymore. The question's simple: Is this UConn team better than last season's UConn team? What do you think? Yes, yes. Uh, this is this team is better than last year's national championship team. I think there's a case to be made. This is the best UConn team in program history. And this is a very proud program. They've got multiple national championships. Um, last year's UConn team was, I mean, just, it, it crushed everybody. Uh, they were they were dominant. I had a, a little bit of a lull in the regular season, but dominant during the NCAA tournament. Uh, ended up winning 31 games. This team, defensively, when they lock in, they are completely unstoppable offensively. I mean, they have so many different guys they, they can throw at you. Tristan Newton was great tonight. Stephon Castle. Oh, just a, a five-star freshman who's who's coming up and, you know, having a big game. Uh, Cam Spencer, who's like Dan Hurley's clone, um, has a big game tonight. And Donovan Klingon really didn't have his A-plus stuff, and they didn't really need it. They ended up winning by 30 points. I mean, just the weapons that this UConn team has is hilarious and unfair. And I think there is a very strong case that this UConn team, better than last year's UConn team, better than any UConn team in program history. Yeah. I mean, all the data suggests that that's true. You know, your eyeballs can tell you whatever you want your eyeballs to tell you, but all the data supports that. And like Brent Stover put that question to me, it's sort of playing off of we were carrying the San Diego State press conference live. So we were coming right off of a Brian Dutcher press conference and somebody asked Brian, is UConn better this season than they were last season? Because obviously San Diego State played UConn and got beat by UConn in the national title game of last season's NCAA tournament. And Brian was good. He sort of smiled and he said, well, they're either better or we're worse. <laughs> you know, and I think probably both things are true. I think UConn's probably better and San Diego State's probably a little worse. And that's how you get a, a you know, a you know, 30 point victory in the in the sweet 16. And. You know, when when Stover asked me that, I, the, the way I explained it was if you'd asked me that in November, I'd have rolled my eyes at you. And in December, probably same thing, although I'd have been like, you know, I'd have considered it. January, I still think my answer is no. February, maybe I'm still like, let's slow down. You know, I'm still I'm still on Purdue. But, I mean, I've reached a point where I think the right answer is yes, they're better. They just are. And, yeah. like, there's some very basic ways to, to highlight this. You know, they didn't win the Big East last season. They won the Big East this season by four games. Mm -hmm. They didn't win the Big East tournament last season. They won the Big East tournament. This season, no problem. Um, they've got a better record at this point in the season than they had at this point last season. The computer numbers are better across the board. They just are. So it sounds absurd to wonder if a team that won a national you got to think about what we're thinking about here. A team that won the national championship by blowing out everybody in the NCAA tournament and had two NBA draft picks, including one lottery pick, and that doesn't even include, include the guy who was the most outstanding player of the Final Four. They lost all three of those guys. Is this team better? It sounds like an absurd thing to even, like, what? Of course not, except somehow, some way. Cam Spencer's part of it. The development of Tristan Newton, Newton's part of it. Uh, Stefan Castle's part of it. Somehow, some way, it, it appears that Dan Hurley, <laughs> after winning a national championship in absurd fashion has built and developed a team that's even better than that team. It doesn't guarantee anything, but I am well aware of why UConn is, is becoming a, a pretty sizable favorite to win this thing. It's because consistently now for a while um, they've, they've just blown out everybody and, you know, they've never lost on a neutral court all year. Never lost at home all year. Um, they, they're they the favorite for a reason. I get it. I'm still going to pick Purdue just because I'm going to go <laughs> picking and screaming. But I uh, I understand if you're not. I understand if you're picking UConn instead. They look the part. Yeah, you're a boil, you're a Boilermaker. I'm half. I'm 60% Boilermaker. I was 40% Aggie, but now I 
I got to think about that. You know, we've had some changes up there in Logan, you know? That's true. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. That's going to be an interesting matchup. Purdue, UConn, if that happens. Who are you riding with? You're riding with Purdue all the way? Well, I mean, I have to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the only way we could get the Purdue UConn would be in the title game. Of course. And if I if I'm the if I'm the idiot who's been screaming Purdue all year long, that would be a terrible time to back off of it, right? I mean, I at mean, that point, I mean, if I was going to back off of it, tonight would be the night to do it. You can change your priors. Change your priors. Well, no, no, no. Well, here's the thing. Like everybody's like, look at what UConn just did to San Diego State, and I am too. I just did it for five minutes. Yeah. Look at what Purdue just did to Utah State. No, that's true. Yes. All right. So, like, you know. Utah right. State was your Mountain West champ. Yeah. So, like, we get caught up in a moment, and I know, like, UConn has been doing this to good teams more regularly than anybody else. Yep. But, like, we just watched Purdue beat the actual champion from that same league, you know, by a billion. So, yep. if we're headed that way, that's where I want to get. You know, I, I mean, I'll take a championship game however it comes, but Purdue-UConn would obviously be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think UConn has been in kind of in its own tier for – the last couple of weeks. Um, but Purdue, lest we not forget, has been a clear top two team in college basketball this season. Maybe top three. You want to throw Houston in there, UConn, Houston, and Purdue. The way Purdue's playing right now uh, killed the Aggies. Um, they're playing on a different level right now. Edie is dominating. Their guards are playing with a lot of confidence. Yeah, it feels like we're on a collision, a collision course for UConn Purdue. Um, we'll see if it happens. Yeah, it, 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 my history with saying stuff like that is it, 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 that guarantees something bad is going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> Anytime I say like, "What?" You, there's a clip I think Nada retweeted it at some point where Norlander was, I, I think, giving me stuff for uh, for being so heavy on like one seeds and two seeds, and like you know, he's always, "How could you pick three number one seeds and a two seed or whatever to get to the final four? You know, it never goes that way. And I'm like, I don't know. I just like picking the better teams. I don't know. I just watch for four months and I go, I, I'm pretty sure this team's better than this team. And then I'll, I'll pick it. And then, you know, and then it doesn't. And then, and then Jack Golke happens. What do you want me to do? All right. So he's given me, he's given me like the business. And then at some point, I don't even really remember the context, but at some point I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to pick Clemson? <laughs> I just sort of said it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, and now here we are. That's that's the nature of this tournament. Where Norlander is right is that something like this always happens. What is difficult is trying to identify where this something like this is going to happen, right. because it it almost never makes sense. You almost never saw it coming. I mean, Clemson was two games above five hundred in the ACC, and I know the ACC was tougher than everybody thinks. I know. I got it. I got it. I know. I know the ACC was tougher than anybody thinks. Although I did just watch the normal ACC outright champs get eliminated so by like, you know, by a not by a not SEC champion, but wh whatever, we don't have to talk about that right now. I'm just saying, you know, Clemson was just a whatever team in the in in the ACC and and uh and now they're, you know, in the Elite 8 and you know, all of this stuff is you you it you can you can safely assume going into any tournament that something like this is going to happen, um, but you don't know where it's coming. I promise you, even Brad Brunell didn't know where this was coming from. No chance. You think in his own bracket he picked Clemson to go this far? Well, I mean, I hope he did, but but I I will say like there are there are there are times when we're doing the candid coaches thing and we're asking like who's going to be the best team in the country. And most coaches don't vote for themselves because we're, you know, we're texting a mid-major coach or whatever. But like, there are coaches sometimes who like absolutely say, uh, "We will, we will be the best team in the country." I have multiple coaches this year who pick themselves to be a uh, best team in the country. And if one of them wins it, I might, you know, turn that into something. But uh, you know, I, I hope Brad Brunell picked his Clemson to go to the Elite Eight. But I'm not certain he was uh, he was counting on it. Either way, I'm happy for him. Uh, let's go back to the East. Because after we got UConn running through San Diego State and advancing to the Elite Eight for the second straight year, I think probably the best game of the night. Would you call it the best game of the night? Final score, Illinois 72, Iowa State 69. I'll be honest, I'm on TV the entire time this game is going. We're watching it, but we're also talking on live TV and there's only so much you can do. So I know Terrence Shannon was uh, terrific again, 10 of 19 from the field. 
29 points. I get the sense that um, it was a, a fun back and forth affair where maybe one team didn't lose it as much as one team went out and won it. Maybe the team with the best player, maybe that's what it comes down to is just one team had Terrence Shannon, the other team didn't. And, 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 you know, he went out and got 29. And so now you're in the elite eight and the other team season's over. You tell me, what did you make of Illinois three point win over Iowa state? Yeah, I would rank it second best game on the night. I think uh, Alabama Carolina was, was clearly in its own tier, but Illinois, Iowa state was very, very good. Um, Iowa state actually trailed by 13. Um, it looked at one point like Illinois is going to end up running away from this. Uh, but Terrence Shannon got into foul trouble in the second half. He, after a, a huge first half, uh, had 20 points in the first half, ends up with 29 points, still a solid game, um, makes a big plays late. But there was a stretch there where he sat on the bench in foul trouble. And Iowa State made a little bit of a run. Um, Iowa State finished 13 of 27 on layups per stat broadcast. <laughs> Just absolutely brutal. Uh, just a ton of bunnies that it felt like, man, if, if, if Cyclones just had even hit maybe half the ones that they missed, uh, we're talking about a totally different game. But but we're not. Illinois is going on, and they're going to be playing UConn in the Elite Eight. Terrence Shannon just playing out of his mind right now. 29 points in this one, obviously. Had 30 points against Duquesne and 26 points against Moorhead. Uh, as you kind of mentioned uh, just a minute ago, it, it kind of came down to – Illinois had the best player on the floor and right. Iowa state did not. Um, there was a little bit more to it than that, but Shannon was, was, uh, was just firing on all cylinders as he has been, you know, throughout this entire postseason, really. And he is the type of guard and obviously he's, um, you know, his season has been overshadowed by a legal issue. He was removed from competition briefly. Um, he, has not gotten the attention in a positive way this season that an RJ Davis got at North Carolina, that a Jamal shed has gotten at Houston, that a Tristan Newton has gotten at UConn, um, that a Mark Sears has gotten at Alabama, frankly. Um, but he's that same level guard. I mean, he's that same level guy who can go out and take over games. And, you know, if you're trying to li put a t list together of perimeter oriented players, who can take over games and maybe carry you to a final four or to even a national championship. Um, Terrence Shannon Jr. is he's on that list as a basketball player. The other stuff is, is complicated mm -hmm. and it makes the entire story complicated and it will become a bigger story. The further Illinois goes like at some point, I know Brad Underwood's been asked questions, but those questions aren't going to stop and they certainly won't stop at the final four. If they get there, they'll just, they'll ramp up and they'll probably get a more, a little more intense and a little more direct. Um, but if we're strictly talking basketball here, uh, this young man is one of the best basketball players in the country. He's looked like it consistently and he's not the only reason Illinois is in this position, but he's definitely the biggest. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Illinois is definitely more than Terrence Shannon jr. Um, tonight, Marcus Domask you know, get a little bit struggled uh, seven points in this game, but you know, Domask is a guy who can go for 20 points on any given night. Coleman Hawkins finishes with 12 points, uh, has three assists, looks the part. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of weapons on this Illinois team that, you know, I'm not going to be picking them uh, to beat UConn, but if they end up giving UConn a little bit of a push, it would be totally surprising. This team is red, red hot right now. Um, so with that, we'll look ahead to Saturday. Just make sure you understand the tip times. 6.09 p.m. Eastern on TBS. That's number one UConn in the East. I guess the third seed, Illinois. And then at 8.49, we'll go to the West region and we'll have Clemson and Alabama. I haven't seen point spreads placed on these games yet, but I did see the Ken Palm numbers. And at Ken Palm, it is Alabama minus two over Clemson and UConn minus six over Illinois. So the numbers when they're posted will be something similar to that. And this just sort of made me chuckle. Um, you know, how when you go to a scoreboard page, um, it'll say, you know, there's, there's certain scoreboard pages and they'll have links to like a secondary market. And it'll say tickets as low as this and tickets as low as this. So Illinois, UConn in Boston on Saturday night. What's the cheapest ticker ticket 
at 1.48 a.m. Eastern on March 29th. Ooh. If you wanted to go right now and buy a ticket to Illinois UConn at this secondary market, what is the cheapest ticket you could buy? Worst ticket in the place, this, what's the number on it? Uh, it's it's one hundred thirty seven dollars and twelve cents. It's two oh three. Okay. The get in price is two oh three as of this moment. If you want to have the worst seat in the building, it will cost you two oh three. That's pretty high. Now remember what I told you. If you wanted to go see Alabama and Clemson in L.A., you could you probably could probably, probably get you could probably get you in there pretty good. Yeah. Cheapest ticket to get in to Crypto.com Arena on Saturday for an Elite Eight game between Alabama and Clemson. What do you think that one is? $137.12. 34 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> 34 bucks. About to catch a plane. You should That's catch cool. a plane. <laughs> you should <laughs> catch a plane. You could see Nate Oates or Brad Brannell, one of the two, make their first ever Final Four. Wouldn't that be something? I'll see him in the Final Four. Yeah, 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 you know, I'll Venmo you like a – I'll Venmo you. I'll Venmo okay. you like 300 bucks. We'll, we'll, buy, we'll send the whole family. Double Dog Dare Me? I'm just going <laughs> to – Just get on the play. <laughs> Just desert my duties here in Dallas and the, the, the poor the poor folks at crypto.com arena, you know they're you know they're not happy about this. I thought hold up. I thought we were about to have North Carolina and Arizona jam-packed. Now we got Clemson, Alabama. You can get in for 34 bucks. I hope you do. What I hope you do. I hope uh I hope if you're in the Southern California, you could hey get to watch history. Either Alabama or Clemson is going to the Final Four in the sport of men's basketball. You don't see that every day, Strong Jaw. You really don't. You really don't. You really don't. All right. That feels like enough. That feels like enough. I'm under instructions. They said we're trying to keep these between 30 and 40. So this feels like enough. We did it. Now, now. For this, GP, or is this like a three-hour unwind window for you? I wish it was an unwind window. I wish I could just pour a big drink and listen to cowboy carter <laughs> instead instead no i've got to prepare for two different shows tomorrow uh i i uh we, i would do the gp show at 11 a.m eastern mm -hmm. and then i will do the ion college basketball podcast on cbs sports network at two o'clock eastern so i will uh i will uh i'll say goodbye and then i'll just start preparing for more things and then i'll do them tomorrow and then uh you know, and then we'll be back here tomorrow night. Oh, it's going to be great. Isn't this the fun time of the year? This is the best this, time. Of the year. Absolutely. Isn't this some... the, you know, I actually think like August is the best time of the year. I really enjoy August. Yeah. Like you know, end of April. Uh, yeah. Is always pretty swell. Yeah. You ain't never going to catch me talking on, on camera at two o'clock in the morning in August. I tell you that. You, so you're saying you're, uh, you're built like Mar built for March in the same way. John Calipari's Kentucky team is built for March. Well, at least it, it, this don't seem like the time to be taking shots at Coach Cal, <laughs> Cal Boone. Kick a man while he's down. Kick a man while he's down. He'll bounce back. There's always next year. He's got a good recruiting class coming. That should work, right? The, a lot of really promising freshmen. Yeah. Do great. Yeah, I mean, he's got good freshmen again. What could go wrong? I'm okay. sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. Shouts to Devin Downey. I always forget it's so late when I'm doing that in this hotel room. I always forget there's got to be somebody right next to me going, what in the world are we doing? I don't know. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M.F. and Teagle. He's a legend. Huck Larnell. Thank you guys for watching, listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. I honestly have no idea. Like, we're going head-to-head -head with Beyonce. Like, what are you even here for? Seriously. Your options were to – Hang out with me and Strongjaw or listen to the new Beyonce album. It's crazy that any of you are here. But uh, I appreciate you. And we'll see you Friday afternoon, 2 o'clock Eastern on CBS Sports Network. Till then, take care.